Hello, and welcome to episode 32 of the Carry On With Carrie podcast. Today, I am really excited to introduce you to um, Todd Rennebaum. He is the host extraordinaire of the podcast, Bunny Hugs and Mental Health. He's also the author of the children's book, Sometimes Daddy Cries. Hello and welcome. Thank you. Extraordinaire. Yes. <laughs> and I, I, you, you're, there was a bit of a blip when you were saying my last name. I, I, I just want to make sure. I'm just curious how you pronounced it because lots of people get it wrong. Renabom. Perfect. We're That's good. It. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. People want <laughs> to say Renabom. I'm like, I'm like, no, that would, yeah, that's no. too many ends. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's, it's not a common name. So I get yeah. it. But yeah. Even people in my own family say it differently. Really? It's like my cousins will pronounce it Renabom. I'm like, what? Oh. I always thought it's, it was Renabom. <laughs> it's like, it's more official. It's more like, you know, it's like, um, did you ever see the show Mrs. Bucket? No. It's don't know that her one. husband. They, she called herself Mrs. Bouquet, but it was spelt bucket. So, oh. you know. <laughs> It's like Fancy. Joe Dirte, Joe Dirt. <laughs> oh, I haven't heard that one, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, well, thank yeah. you for having me. Yes, thank you so much for being here. We've talked a few times, and um, we recorded one other time, and, you know, things messed up a little bit on my end. So thank you for coming back, and I'm just transparent about these things because I really appreciate you uh, taking the time again. It's my pleasure. Um, you, you're, as I was saying earlier, just a lovely person. And I, uh, you know, so I, I like speaking to lovely people. Thank you. <laughs> lovely people. I'll even good. do it twice. Okay. <laughs> right on. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess um, you've started your podcast is um, mental health and wellness as well. Um, anything to do with mental health, the stories from survivors, the stories from, you know, all sorts of different sides of things. Can you kind of give us yeah. some history? Yeah. I, well, I started it in during COVID, like most podcasts seems like. <laughs> um, yep. uh, I was, you know, bored. I'd already kind of been advocating for mental health for a while. And so I'd played in bands and stuff. So I had all the gear and I knew can add connections and I was bored. So I was like, you know, I, I've been kicking around the idea anyway. So I started it. Uh, it was only meant to be uh, maybe five to 10 episodes and it was going to be, you know, Saskatchewan based stories only. Um, but I, I really enjoy doing it. So uh, yeah, I've just kept going and I think I've done 130 episodes now, I think. Wow. And yeah. And it's, um, Mental health is such a, you know, big subject matter that uh, I can basically talk to whoever I want <laughs> yeah. about anything. And uh, they say, you know, you should you should have you should narrow down when you're podcasting. You should be very specific audience. And I'm, but so I'm kind of doing the opposite. I'm I'm keeping it pretty wide open because I don't want to narrow it down to just borderline personality disorder or just OCD or just depression right. I, I or just professionals or whatever. So I, yeah, I talk to uh, lots of people about different mental health issues, different mental illnesses, different uh, traumatic events and things. So mm -hmm. uh, addictions, whatever. So, so yeah, it's been, uh, it's been pretty amazing. I, I love it. it. And I've, 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 I've gained a lot of, personal friends from it, even like, I, you know, you, you can't help but make connections and uh, relationships and stuff. And so yeah, probably my closest friends right now are people I've never met <laughs> in person. There you go. <laughs> yeah. 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 Because it's, it's amazing how just speaking up about these things, you can relate to somebody else. And when you say, you know, if, if anybody says they've never experienced any kind of mental health issues in any part of their life, whether it be with themselves or with somebody else, I find that really hard to believe because I think in some way we've all been affected at some point. Yeah, yeah. Some maybe more that's than a others, mental, obviously. Maybe that's a mental illness itself is thinking you've never had to deal with a mental health issue. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> we'll we'll diagnose in the DSM that one. six. <laughs> denial. Yeah, denial. <laughs> oh boy, syndrome. that's good. Yeah, the denial syndrome. So, yeah. 
yeah so some of your history then like you um you are coming from a place of experience in what way uh well i'm a, a suicide attempt survivor um I've gone through addiction treatment. Uh, I've, I'm seven years clean now. Uh, Congratulations. Thank you. Um, yeah, and then I started doing some advocating after uh, – well, actually, it was before I even got sober. Um, and uh, I wrote a kid's book a few years back. Uh, and, yeah, I just – I've just been chugging along doing stuff. And as recently as this fall, I've been trying new treatments for um, – mental health issues and trauma and stuff. I did some EMDR therapy and uh, about a year ago I was diagnosed with ADHD. So it's, it's a never ending journey. And, and like my suicide attempt, that was like 10 years ago or something. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's a, it's an everyday maintenance journey, peeling the layers from the onion and yep. uh, just keep healing. And th- this time next year, I might have a whole other, chapter of healing that I don't know about right now. (laughs) Right. And you actually do over time. Like I know for me, I'll think ahead that way, like enjoy the moment I'm at, if it's going good at the the time, but you do have to think about, okay, well, what could next year be? Right. Don't you find? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, any, every time I, I, I heal, it's like, I, I don't, I'm never as dark as I once was. Like I never quite hit that, that darkness it's like oh you know shit's kind of like being stirred up in me for some reason uh maybe i should you know look into this and uh investigate it a bit more and talk to somebody try a different modality maybe so um so yeah it's never it's never gotten as dark as it has before because you know i'm much more self-aware now and uh, i do use other strategies and things and it's like okay maybe Maybe these strategies aren't quite working for this specific trauma I'm dealing with or this specific, um, well, like ADHD. Like I found a traditional uh, talk therapy didn't really help it. Mm-hmm. So then, wow, well, I didn't know I had ADHD then. So, but, I, but, but yeah. So anyway, I, I was like, well, maybe I need to be assessed with something. So yeah, it's just, it's always just trying different things and you can never have too many tools in your toolbox or, um, yeah, too many strategies or too many um, modalities. So, because mm-hmm. um, you never know. Yeah, there's no one size fits all for for healing, even That's within sure. yourself. So, mm-hmm. like, okay, a twelve step program helped me get sober, but maybe that won't help me with my ADHD, or that's not going to help me with my uh, trauma that I can't seem to get over, or my whatever. Right. So. Yeah. So yeah. Hundred mm-hmm, percent. Yeah. And I mean, do you find too that doing the podcast has given you, like, is helping you on the healing journey? Um, yeah, I, yeah, I think so. (laughs) I'm sure I have specifics. I can't think of any right now, but if, if nothing else, it's just, um, you know, hearing other people's stories, uh, sometimes someone says, you know, it's like being, it's almost like being at an AA meeting sometimes, you know, I'm always hearing something profound from my guests every time Mm -hmm. I'm talking to someone, there's always something that I'm learning something. uh, Even if it's not about myself, I'm learning, uh, you know, to be more empathetic, empathetic or more compassion for someone else because they're telling me something uh, about, about them or their loved ones Mm -hmm. or whatever. And so, uh, so yeah, it's, if nothing else, if, if it's not healing, then at least I'm learning more strategies and learning um, more empathy for other people. Empathy, yeah. Exactly. And empathy for situations that maybe you wouldn't have ever thought you could. Right. I think yeah. I, I just listened to an episode. You, I can't remember which one it was, but it was a replay. This oh, last week. Um, uh, with, with Chad Miro and, and Spencer, uh, I can't think of his last name, but uh, yeah. Chad's sister and her. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it was Chad sister and her husband and their two kids were killed by a drunk driver and the story evolves into chad then becoming best friends and almost a mentor to the son of the driver that hit them uh right. and it's it's just a beautiful i mean it's a tragic story but it's also very beautiful and um just listen to him going through his 
uh, journey and like forgiveness and, and okay. yeah, yeah. And, and knowing that, you know, on their side, they, they were also going through traumatic, um, going through trauma because of this accident. And it was right. the mother, not the father was the mother that was actually driving. And, uh, so yeah. And, and yeah, everyone just, just being humans and empathetic with, for each other. And right. yeah, it's a beautiful story. Yeah. It's a, it it's is. And I enjoyed that. One. It was, um, but you know, it sure gives you from the perspective it's this thing you can't always put yourself in someone else's shoes, but if you are take the time to share and listen to these stories, everybody's got a side or he's got the, you know, how it affected them. That's right. So, uh, and I, I learned a lot of that while in addiction treatment, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I've always been, you know, a decent enough guy, <laughs> you know, so I've yeah. always had somewhat some compassion and empathy, but, yeah. but going through treatment, it's like, it's very eye opening because, uh, the, the treatment I went to was all, there was no one-on-one -on -one therapy. It's always group therapy. Uh, mm -hmm. and you're sitting in a room with people you would never like ever associate with, right? Like yeah. I'm talking like dudes with face tattoos that are like gangsters and stuff. And like, I'm like, what the hell is it? And then, you know, you're hugging and crying, you know, half an hour later, each other. Right. And, you know, I'm still good friends with these people that are like, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's all because, you know, we, we all we all saw each other as uh, hurting people that needed healing. And uh, you know, it doesn't matter what walk of life you're from. It mm -hmm. all, it's all very painful and it all sucks. And we all want to, we all want the same thing. That's right. You know, to be respected and loved and validated and, and mm -hmm. to get that from each other in those groups, it was, it was amazing. So uh, that's maybe one of the biggest things I learned going through addiction treatment was just probably empathy. You become a grateful alcoholic. That's at least, Kind of, I remember hearing that in the rooms when I was going, and um, yeah. I'm like, "What?" But now I see it. <laughs> now I get it. I understand yeah. that, right? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, and I've said before, like, and one of the reasons I, I would consider myself a grateful alcoholic or person in recovery or addict or whatever you want, whatever mm -hmm. I want to call it, uh, is is having that opportunity to go to treatment. I, after coming out of there, I said to my wife, like, I don't care if you you have addiction issues or not. I think everybody should spend 28 days in a place like that and just yeah. have a good sit down and hard look at yourself in the mirror and, and in a group with people that, you know, you, you can learn empathy from and uh, relate to. Cause I mean, I never thought I would have anything to relate to. To, to do with people coming out of jail or mm -hmm. there was even a rich like restaurant tour in there <laughs> right like it's it's, yeah. a, it's a, literally a cross-section of society and it's like you know we, again we're we all hurting from very similar things and we all want very similar things so mm -hmm. there's we are we have way more in common than than not in common all of us in society yep. so then it's it makes it just so much easier coming out of there and to have empathy so, That's right. Uh, yeah, I think everybody, if you have the opportunity to go to addiction treatment, <laughs> whether you're an addict or <laughs> not, it. do it. It's it's Highly challenging. It, it was the hardest month of my life, but also the most uh, rewarding. Like I, mm -hmm. I have, the, uh, yeah, it's like boot camp too. Because I mean, it's like the second your eyes are open to the second they're closed at night, you are working. It's not like, right? Yeah, it's. I mean that that treatment center. Anyway, I can't speak for other treatment centers, but. Yeah. yeah, I think a lot of people I talk to, it is, it's pretty hardcore. It's, you know, you're, you're immersed right in it. I learned a lot From about myself. You, yes. And it's yeah. tiring learning a lot about yourself, isn't it? It is. And it is. I mean, for me, I, I, I went in there. I mean, I was fed up. Like mm -hmm. I, I was like, okay, I'm surrendering to the process because <laughs> something's yeah. got to change. I'm going in with an open mind. And, you know, at the end of the month, then I'll reevaluate and be like, eh, mm -hmm. I'll take this and leave that. But uh, so I went in with a fairly good attitude. Um, and so, yeah, that helped a lot because I did see people come in with a chip on their shoulder. They were pissed off because their boss made them go or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever their story was. And they didn't last longer. They didn't learn a goddamn thing. They weren't ready. <laughs> so, they weren't yeah. ready. You have to be ready. They weren't ready. Yeah. yeah. But it so, has to yeah. be bad enough well, for them. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So can you give us a little bit of backstory then like where um, you're what you've kind of 
dealt with in the past with depression, <laughs> with mental health issues. <laughs> yes. If you're comfortable okay. with that. Yes. Um, as you know, I can talk a lot for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll try not to make it uh, too, too long. But um, I, I kind of go back to, I think it was grade five was when I really started to, um, really when it started to affect me, uh, as the anxiety. I was diagnosed mm -hmm. with a stomach ulcer in grade five. Wow. And I mean, that's like something like CEOs of billion dollar companies get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I'm in grade five and I'm like, uh, and of course, I, I'm, so I'm 45 years old. So that's, you know, over 35 years ago. So there was no, uh, you know, why is he worrying so much? Why is, does he have anxiety? I've never, I didn't even hear the word anxiety. I didn't even know what anxiety meant until I was like 17. Mm -hmm. So in grade five, they were just treating me physically, right? They were treating the symptoms, but not, but, but not the causes. Um, if anything, it was probably, it probably got a little worse after that because of, you know, because it was frustrating for parents too. They'd be like, "Oh my God, we just stop worrying." So now it's like, now I've made my parents mad, and I'm worrying. Right. <laughs> now yeah. I'm worried that my parents are mad at me. <laughs> it's like, it's like, God, it's almost better off not being diagnosed, but just shoving uh, it so, down. <laughs> yeah. So it's been, you know, since grade five that I'm. Well, obviously before grade five, because I was diagnosed with a stomach ulcer in grade five. So it was years yeah. before that, that I've, I was um, dealing with anxiety and stuff. And then going into high school, you know, like I grew up in a small town, so I only had a handful of um, people to be friends with and you're friends with those people right from kindergarten. And mm -hmm. so once you're labeled in kindergarten with something like, well, that's your label right till you leave town basically. Uh, and so, you know, as a, young guy growing up in the eighties. I was skinny. I wasn't, I wasn't a farmer and I wasn't a hockey player. So I had to be the class clown. Right. So then I, mm -hmm. I you know, I kind of got that role and uh, which then turned into the party guy because um, you know, I'd go to the hockey parties, even though I wasn't the hockey player, but I was the jester at the party. Right? Mm -hmm. So I was like, so I was still, you know, I wasn't, I wouldn't say I was unpopular. I was very sensitive and, you know, I would take, um, I, 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 some, I sometimes used the word bullying, but it wasn't really bullying. It was more like young boys just, you know, being assholes to each other for no real reason. Right. Because that was kind of just the way it was. It's kind of the yeah, way you guys and I yeah, interact. Yeah. It, but I took it but... probably harder than other people, right? Like I would actually mm -hmm. like, you know, it, it affected me more probably. I shouldn't, I should say probably, I, I don't know. I'm sure the other guys were affected too. Um, and so anyway, I, you know, so I kind of turned to drinking in high school. Um, so my anxiety and my, yeah, my anxiety wasn't quite as bad. I was a terrible student. I had decent grades, but I had a terrible attitude. <laughs> like I hated okay. school. I was bored. I didn't like it. It was just, it made no, I was just like, well, what's the point of this? You know? Yeah. Um, and then, uh, grade 12 was like my last uh, month of grade 12. I found it hard to get out of bed and I was like just miserable, sad. And like, so my anxiety and stuff is turning into depression. And like, I'm, I, I, I hated living at home. I hated high school. I didn't like living in my small town. So, you know, I should have been excited. It's like, well, you know, one month left and I'm out of here. But for whatever reason, it turned to depression and stuff. And mm -hmm. um, the first time I drank in grade seven, I had like some sexual trauma with other boys. I don't say I never say I was um, I don't ever say I was abused or anything because I don't feel like I was preyed upon or that there was any malicious intent. It was just mm -hmm. it was child on child and it was just you know, highly inappropriate and highly sexualized and very, yeah. well, let's be honest with you. It's still very confusing. Um, so I don't, I don't ever felt like I was a victim uh, other than a victim of circumstance really. Right. Um, so, so I, I always say I was, I have sexual trauma. I don't say I was, I was abused or preyed upon or anything. So anyway, mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I was also dealing with that in high school. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, 
I'm not making this fast at all. I said I was going <laughs> to try. It's okay. Fast. It's good. I like. I want to hear it all. <laughs> um, so then out of high school, I, I moved to uh, the metropolis of Regina, Saskatchewan. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, was like, I couldn't wait to be in the big city. And uh, my first job was at uh, the Regina Humane Society. And uh, I thought it would be cool. You know, I'm working with animals and stuff. But one of my duties was actually like putting animals down and like oh. dealing with, you know, abused animals and like, yeah. <laughs> like it was so you hear you're being, depressed already yeah well yeah it was like it was uh, it was it was weird um i also had like this uh really intense relationship with a coworker who was getting married and it's i had this big time crush on on this coworker and to me it was fine she was also my roommate um mm-hmm. Because I thought it was fine. It was like, whatever. That's it's my cross to bear because whatever, I have a crush on someone, whatever. But she admitted to me one time that she had feelings for me, but she was like engaged. And, but she's like, you know, obviously nothing can happen. <laughs> so that was like, that was like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. why, why'd you tell me that? I was better off not knowing. Right. Like, so that fucked me up. Uh, yeah. My, my director, the director at work at the time, she, uh, she did sexually assault me at a, at a work party. She was around 40 or 50 years old and she tried making out with me and this was before me too. So I basically Mm -hmm. left. I just left work. Uh, Nothing happened to her. She was like, she was on this pedestal with the staff and the board and the city and everything. So, um, so that was confusing. So it was like after my first year out of high school, I mean, I, it was like, I I was like, I was a little fucked up to be honest with you. And, I was starting to get uh, suicidal ideation at 18 years old, mostly when I was drinking. So yeah. it wasn't so much when I was sober, uh, but I was drinking a lot. So, you know, I was the guy at the end of the night that was like crying and causing a scene and mm-hmm. uttering threats. And um, of course, back then, mental health stuff wasn't really talked about. And the next, usually the next morning, no one would talk about <laughs> the stuff I said or kind of right. ignored it or not always. I, I, there was a couple of friends that were like, maybe you should talk to your parents. Of course I'd call my parents and they'd be like, you're not suicidal. Don't be silly. <laughs> so like that. Right. Like, oh, just, okay. So that's how it was. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. they didn't know either. Right. They yeah. it, were, it, it was just the, you know, the time and the day mm-hmm. um, or the, you know, that era. Uh, era, so, yeah. so I, th- I'm, I just remember thinking like, holy shit, is this what it, is this what being an adult is? Like, I thought I hated high school. Like mm-hmm. now I'm like killing animals. <laughs> I'm like, old ladies are trying to make out with me. I'm falling in love with people that are also in love with me, but told me, you know, nothing can ever happen. Um, and I'm like, I'm suicidal. Every time I drink, I'm drinking five, six times a week. Like what the, like that was my first year out of high school. So right. was, uh, uh, yeah, it was kind of a. A kind of a messed up time and it was like this is what i was this is what i was so excited for mm-hmm. <laughs> this is what i wanted out of my town for um but but then you know things got better i uh i tried going to university um i didn't try that hard <laughs> I, I, in a year i took like six classes and i passed like four um right. i drank a lot uh but i did um I met some guys and we, we started a band or okay. they already had a band. They were looking for a drummer actually. And I was a drummer. Uh, so that was cool. I was like, wow, I'm going to band in the city. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a Regina band. Wow. Yeah, Regina band. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of, of course, band. Of course, in those days, there was probably like five, six different places you could play like venues. Right. right? <laughs> now I don't think there's any, but uh, anyway, really? again, it was the era. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so yeah, then that was cool. And, you know, I, I, I started bouncing around from job to job, staying in the band. And then eventually, um, I, uh, we, we all quit our jobs and went on tour and like, we, we became a professional band and we toured and we had a video and much music that was played. And, uh, wow. we were starting to get like, uh, a little bit of, uh, traction with all that. And it was, it was super fun. Like it was, it was <laughs> Yeah, it was incredible fun. It was just exciting. It was cool. I was still 
miserable and suicidal at times when I drank and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like I wasn't, um, I, I, and I didn't know, I understand why, um, I started seeing a girl around this time when you had moved in. So th that was really great. Cause I, mm -hmm. I was like madly in love. And so things were good, even though I was, like I said, had <laughs> moments of not being good. It was still, I mean, probably the best time of my life ish. Yeah. Um, and then eventually, um, uh, well, I'll just say my wife, cause I, she's now my wife, this mm -hmm. girl, <laughs> the band broke up and stuff. And, um, we decided to buy a house, move back to the town I'm in now where I grew up, Indian head. And at that time we could buy a house and a beautiful yard for like $35,000. We were making $7 an hour and it, it, that was easily affordable. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think my kids are going to live with me until they're 40 because they can't afford a house. Um, it's crazy but anyway, right now, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, we, you know, we, we were in love, you know, we're back in the small town and my, my anxiety and my depression at this point started to turn into more anger. Uh, and that is very common, especially at that time for a lot of men, but mm -hmm. especially men in my family, like growing up around my grandparents and my dad and my uncles and stuff like they're, they were like guys that were like, ah, you know, they'd fly off the handle anytime they were working on the car. Hold the light here. Hold the light here. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. you know? <laughs> I said here. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck is I going to do? Yeah. Like, <laughs> but I, yeah, I, I, I was, I was so unsatisfied other than my home life. Like I loved my wife. I loved my little house, but I despised my job. I was just like not satisfied. I was like, I'm supposed to be a rock star. And I'm making seven bucks an hour, you know, like <laughs> all mad. And I, I'd wake up in the morning, like furious, already just furious. And I hated it. I, I almost rather feeling, I'd almost rather feel depressed than constant anger. I, I don't right. know why. It just, it's just, I don't know. It's, it's embarrassing at times like it's it's almost like I, i'm going through a temper tantrum when I'm like i try to do something i would like throw tools and mm -hmm. stomp and slam doors and i'm like I, I, i'm such an like when i so see guys like more that, shame than than anything yeah yeah, yeah. Like and, and i feeling. scared yeah and my wife is a real mild-mannered lady and so that would yeah. scare her and i'd scare the dog and i was just like ah oh, yuck i don't want to be scary like mm -hmm. i that's how the men were in my life when I was a kid. And I don't want to be like that. <sighs> Sorry. I need a, I need a little sip. Yeah, for sure. And well, you know, the thing <laughs> is you were wrecking, even then you, it sounds like you recognized that you didn't want to be that way. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. There's definitely that's, that's I, something a lot of people don't even get that they are that way. So the fact that you had that insight into yourself, you were already very, sensitive towards what you, you know, what you were going through. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's true. It's, uh, Cause I remember being a kid, even like, yeah, like in elementary school, even and looking at like people in my life and like making notes, like, okay, I don't ever want to be like that person. <laughs> or I don't want to be like that mm -hmm. person. Or, you know, I think if I'm ever like that person, you know, I yeah. gotta put, get myself a check, but, um, but, but I, I, it, that stuck for quite a while though, that, that anger thing. Um, part of it was, um, I just wasn't happy. I wasn't feeling satisfied. Right. So, uh, I, so I quit jobs. I kept bouncing around from job to job, to job again, uh, sometimes being happy for a while at a job, but then mm -hmm. after like a year, two years, I'd the anger stuff would happen again. Or, I'd, um, you know, for whatever reason, I'd, well, we were talking before, it's like I'd be lying in bed and I could almost feel like my my bed melting because I'm just so hot with anger. Like I can't sleep because mm -hmm. of a coworker or of a manager or of a, a customer or whatever. It's like, are, are, is everyone like this? Like, can, <laughs> do other people like not get through life because they're just so obsessed with their job? Like this is, this is a nightmare. Mm -hmm. uh, so then I'd quit and, you know, this whole pattern kept going on. Um, and, uh, eventually I started, uh, using marijuana more often. I was drinking more often. Um, um, and I started to, um, 
I started to have a relationship with a girl that she, we were friends for a couple of years. Uh, and I confided in her kind of like, she could tell that I, you know, I was having depression and anxiety issues and, um, and she was too. And so, you know, we kind of became a support for each other, but then, um, you know, it, we crossed a line at one point, uh, right. and, you know, it turned into, it turned into an emotional affair, which then turned into a full thing. And it's like, but it felt good. I felt, you know, I felt supported. I felt understood. I felt like this intense dopamine hits. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, so now I, but man, at that time it was like day to day was they talk about emotional roller coasters and I, I, I remember it as a teenager going through these emotional roller coasters, but it was not even close to comparison to, to this relationship. It was like, literally, I thought it was euphoric at times, mm -hmm. the, the dopamine and literally 10 minutes later sobbing, wanting to die because of the guilt and the shame and mm -hmm. all the other stuff I was already feeling. But so I, I was really just, I was, I was finding anything that felt good that I could have instant gratification from yes. uh, to get me through the day, even though long-term it was, it was making things much, much worse. <laughs> you know? yeah. So, yeah. so now I'm drunk and high all the time. I'm like going to work mad. I'm having this other relationship. I'm full of like intense guilt and shame because I'm in this relationship because I'm already married and I'm having, I have kids at this point and stuff. And it's just, it, it, it all came to a head at one point and, um, I snapped and I ended up driving to the hospital in Regina and, uh, long story short, I get to the ER and, uh, they basically t tell me to go home. <laughs> you know, I'm like, yeah. I'm suicidal and I'm asking for help. And I've, uh, at this point I'm already on medication. I've, I'm on, uh, I've been seeing a counselor and stuff and they just said, you know, oh, okay, well, and the doctor actually said, like, unless you've attempted suicide, we won't even consider bringing you into the hospital, into the psych mm -hmm. ward. And I thought, well, what the, what, what, <laughs> like, but what if yeah. I was successful or what if I got really, really hurt or, you know, like, what, what are you telling me? And so he's just said, you know, promise me you're not going to hurt yourself. And I was like, okay. And he's like, keep taking your meds and, and keep seeing your counselor. And I went home. Uh, and just like that, just like that. And I was mortified, absolutely mm -hmm. mortified. Uh, I, I thought I felt like I had stubbed my toe and I went to the ER in an ambulance, like, and then they were like, Oh, you baby have a now. Okay. Off you go. Mm -hmm. It was like, I was like, okay, well, apparently I'm never asking for help again because I, I'm obviously I don't need it <laughs> if they're not willing to give it to me. Yeah. And it wasn't like, so maybe I didn't need it in the hospital, but they, there was nothing offered to me other than go home and keep doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And what I was doing was killing me. And it wasn't so working. a year, no, it wasn't working. So a year later, I end up at that same ER, uh, this time handcuffed, uh, with two RCMP officers on my side, strapped to a gurney in an ambulance because I tried to, to attempt suicide again. I tried grabbing a cop's gun. I tried stabbing my brother cause he was trying to stop me. Like it, it I mean, it was a shit show. Um, mm -hmm. and I, yeah, I've just been doing EMDR therapy for that 10 minute <laughs> event in my kitchen. Cause well, it was longer than 10 minutes, but like, yeah, man, it was, it was intense, but, um, and I thought, well, okay, well, finally, this is what I had to do to get into the hospital was yeah. tr try to Go to take that the extreme. cop's gun. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then when I was in the hospital, I was there for two weeks and I, I really, it was really just somewhere to keep me safe. Like I didn't mm -hmm. really get help other than a safe space. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh. <laughs> I was like, okay. I was begging for help and I was running into the hospital and then all they do is like, you know, it was, there's no real help there. Right. Uh, at, at that time, anyway, it could be different now mm -hmm. because like I said, this was about 10 years ago, but, um, so anyway, um, oh man, I feel like I'm rambling. But you know, you think about yeah. 10 years ago, that's not even that long <laughs> ago. And the fact that that's still 
you know, and that's why I admire you for speaking up about this because it could then be another 10 years before things start to change. If more people don't start talking about it, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. 10 years is a blink of an eye as, as I'm starting to realize. (laughs) It it really is. I'm not aging. Uh, myself. And and then I I scroll through my phone and find pictures from 10 years ago. And I was like 60 pounds lighter. I was like, what? This isn't how I remember. What? Right. <laughs> In the blink of an eye, I've gained 60 pounds. What the hell? <laughs> how did that happen? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> um, but anyway, so eventually I left the hospital. But while in the hospital, I I, I, I mean, I, I came to like to my family. I, I opened up about everything, the, the relationship, the, everything. Uh, so that was kind of the beginning of healing, kind of. Mm-hmm. Um. And my wife, she's, she's, she's a smart woman. She, I mean, she knew something was going on um, and she could have easily, I mean, that could have easily been the end of our relationship or, I mean, there's uh, a million ways our relationship could have went. Uh, what ended up happening was I kept seeing a counselor. She saw her own counselor because she realized, you know, she has stuff from her past and traumatic events and stuff that she had to deal with. And we couldn't work on ourselves as a relationship until we both felt good in our own bodies and our own minds. So she, I don't know why or how she knew to do that, (laughs) (laughs) but it was, I mean, it was tough. Um, It was just hard all around because she felt, you know, uh, betrayed and all types of things. And I was full Mm -hmm. of guilt and stuff, but but yet we were clear enough to find help individually. And then as a couple with a counselor and Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we got married really young. So, I mean, you know, we had, we had baggage that we didn't even know that we had until Mm -hmm. this shit was happening. And so we, we grew, we, I I tell people all the time, like we grew up together, even though we didn't grow up together. (laughs) Like we, Mm -hmm. we, we, we got together on age 20. Um, but they really just start growing up around that time. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we so. really did grow up together. We we yeah. are the people who we are now because of what we've, what we, you know, because we've been together so long. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, I, uh, so what happened? So anyway, I left the hospital. I started, you know, I, I th- thought things were better. I was again, I was bouncing around from a couple of different jobs. I started my own, job and stuff. Uh, and after a couple of years, um, I seen the newspaper that the government was cutting, I think it was 20, 20 positions. Okay. I think 11 of them were psych nurses from the, the psych ward that I was in. And I, I, I started crying reading this newspaper article and there were tears of anger and not like temper tantrum anger. Like before, I mean, it was like, Sometimes anger is a good motivation. <laughs> good That's right. Motivator. It is. Yep. And I was like, holy shit. Like how, like I was in there. Like there was, sec- I saw more security half the time than I did uh, psych nurses because they mm-hmm. were so understaffed. Like security does not deescalate. I mean, as soon as security comes on the ward, I mean, people's guards get, I mean, it's, it was, oh, I, I just yeah. could not believe what I was reading. So I wrote this. I don't know. I just went to my computer and onto my word program and I started writing like basically my story. And like, I came out not to, you know, I didn't talk about that other relationship stuff, but I talked about my suicide attempt and what it was like being in the hospital and how this is, these cuts were just the stupidest thing ever. And how I went to the ER at one time and they told me to go home because they didn't have room and all this stuff. So, yeah. uh, so I wrote this letter and, and, in a fit of rage, <laughs> I sent it to media. I put it online. I put it on Facebook and stuff. Uh, and it it went viral. It blew up. Um, I mean, it was shared tens of thousands of times. I don't know how many times now. Mm-hmm. And like all the media from Regina, like all the different news stations called me and came out the next day and interviewed me and talked to me. And I was like, I was like, Oh God, what have I done? Yeah. <laughs> like, what if I started but, here? Yeah. yeah I was like, Holy <laughs> shit. Uh, but it in Saskatchewan, that really kind of got people pissed off. 
and mm-hmm. a lot of people related to my letter and i i mean people came out of the woodwork contacting me and being like this like this exact same thing happened to me and it's you know i agree there should be more jobs not jobs cut and you know so i almost got this little celebrity status for just writing this letter yeah and so I thought, well, okay, I have people's attentions. I got this ball rolling. This momentum isn't, you know, it's going to fizzle out. So I, I kind of went with it a bit and I organized a rally and a few things. Uh, I, you know, I was posting stuff on Facebook and stuff every day about mental health, but I, I was in, I, I, I was still sick myself. I, I mean, I, <laughs> I was not healthy enough to be doing this advocacy work. Mm-hmm. Um, And it quickly, like within a month, I got overwhelmed and I was in the hospital again. Right. Um, Because I was putting pressure on myself and I felt like I can't let people down and all these people are are reaching out to me and thanking me and wanting me to do more. And so, Mm -hmm. so yeah. Um, uh, And yeah. And how do you take all that in and deal with that if you're, you don't even know how to, yeah. Yeah. I don't, (laughs) I'm still, I'm still reeling with guilt from, from stuff that happened years before that. And yeah. yeah. Um, and I was, uh, I, I mean, I was drinking and smoking every, every day. I was drunk and high constantly mm-hmm. at this point in my life when this was going on. Um, and I used to be like, I used to host parties all the time. We were, we were the house where there was always potlucks and functions and things. And after I got out of the hospital that first time, it's, it quickly became no more parties and it was just me and my garage drunk every night and smoking as much pot as I possibly could. Like yeah. there was no more socializing. It was just, now it was just sad and pathetic and was like, yeah. no, this is no good. And that's how I was when this letter came out. Um, and so I was, yeah, I was sitting in my garage one night drinking, um, getting as high as I possibly could again. And, uh, I, I, I thought, okay, enough's enough. Like I've tried quit, quit drinking. I don't know how many times I've tried stop and smoke and pot. I don't know how many times. And so I went into the house and I grabbed all the booze and I thought, okay, I'm going to drink all the alcohol in the house next morning. I'm going to tell my wife the house is alcohol free right now. And this is, let's try to keep it this way because if it's in the house, I'm going to drink it. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course I ended up getting so like maybe the drunkest I've ever been. Um, I'm like puking sick. I'm suicidal again. Uh, I come into the house. I set up my computer and I, I I call it a suicide note of sorts, but it's, uh, I, it is, it it, it wasn't, it wasn't. Uh, I typed this thing up on a word program again. And I, I mean, again, I've, it's all very blurry because I was fucking hammered. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, at some point I I must've had some, uh, a moment of clarity and I woke my wife up, uh, and said, I'm going to hurt myself. And so this is like three in the morning. And Mm -hmm. all I know is I end up at the, in my local hospital and I'm spending a few days in there. Now I'm on IV for, for all the, all the alcohol and stuff. Um, and uh, that night was the last night I ever drank. Um, however, I was Still going out to the parking lot while in the hospital and smoking weed. Right. <laughs> and uh, my doctor, he said, okay, Todd, I know what you're doing. And I want you to cut that out too. And he tried mm-hmm. taking me to uh, detox in Regina. I didn't even make it a night. I had a, a huge panic okay. attack and I just ran out of there. Came home. My wife was all upset. Cause she thought I was in a safe place. Um yeah it, it, again it was it was a bad day but eventually um i went back to the hospital and asked if i could just detox in my local hospital here in Indian right. head i felt safe there um i mean i went to school with some of the nurses because they're from okay. my town right mm-hmm. uh, some of my friends parents work at the hospital i was like and i i like that some people were like you detox in your local hospital like they think i'm nuts like right i'm like no i like that i like you know it was comforting to know that these people knew me and whatever. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I spent well, a couple weeks uh, there. It, honestly, I can say that from your past experience in hospitals, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Because well, yeah, you didn't yeah. have a lot of luck with where, when you went <laughs> to somewhere and you didn't know anybody. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That hundred percent. Yeah. And yeah. I didn't even tell the story about 
when I was in there in the psych ward, um, the one night there was an altercation, I guess you could say with me and a staff member. Uh, and yeah, at one point they locked me in a room overnight and took my bed and just threw a mattress on the floor. And I was in the room with all the cameras and the nursing station was right next to me. And yeah, it was ugly. That's was, tra- was, yeah. The trauma. Yeah. It was. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's one of the reasons why I got pissed off about these jobs being cut. I'm like, like, good mm-hmm. Lord. Like that's the treatment I, I had when I was there. And now you're wanting to cut more jobs. <laughs> like, right. I, this guy was a manager. Mm-hmm. Right? Anyway, that, yep. that's a whole other, I could write an entire book of just my two weeks in the psych ward, but yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I, uh, my doctor's like, I want you to go to treatment. I want you to, um, start going to AA meetings. I want you to start seeing a counselor again and all this stuff. And so I begrudgingly accepted those, <laughs> um, things. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I started going to AA meetings. Um, and I, I started seeing a ther- uh, counselor again and, and then I went to treatment and we kind of discussed treatment earlier, but, um, mm-hmm. and then uh, out of treatment, I, uh, like they say, you know, once you get sober, you know, life becomes easier to live and things fall into place. And it, it kind of was like that. It was like, I got this great job and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, th- things were good. I was saving money and you know, things were good. And I started talking at the treatment center that I went to. They asked me to come talk once a month and that was really cool. And then again, my job was like getting overwhelming for me. So then the treatment center is like, why don't you come work here? So then, two years sober uh, out of this place. I'm working there now and I'm talking to clients and stuff and things were cool. And then COVID hit and my anxiety went through the roof again. Mm And, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm mind up like, since I quit drinking, my depression has never come back. Um, okay. I I still have suicidal thoughts and whatever, like that's there, but like, I've never spent a day in bed since. And there was times where I was like three, four days in a row, I wouldn't get out of bed. Like, Mm -hmm. so that's, that's been amazing. The anxiety, different story, but, um, and then, uh, we were going to open again, even during COVID. And then we had a fire and all this stuff. So anyway, Mm -hmm. um, we're, uh, I'm trying to get to present day. <laughs> so anyway. Can I ask one question though? Can I yeah, just, yeah. you mentioned about like, I find that kind of fascinating and for anybody listening to understand the difference between being depressed and in anxiety. And you said I wasn't depressed anymore. And a lot of people put mm-hmm. the two together that, you, well, if you're depressed, you're anxious, if you're anxious, you're depressed. So yeah, you explained that very well. Like the four days you would spend in bed, you just didn't feel like that anymore. Right. But I did, I was like, like anxiety for me, it's like depression to me is like this very dull, heavy, dark mm-hmm. feeling and anxiety for me. It's like this stabbing fear. <laughs> it's like, I'm constantly afraid and I don't know what the hell to do. And it's like panic. And, and so I was, uh, that was more in me. Mm-hmm. Um, th- uh, I did like working in addictions, but also, the addiction treatment I was at, I worked there for two years. We had five different directors. So, I mean, there was, oh. it was a, kind of an unstable workplace at the time too, plus mm-hmm. COVID. And then we had a fire and the, like the world itself was like, there was uncertainty everywhere. I had two kids yeah. in high school and they're like, do we go to school? I'm like, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. like, nobody knew anything. Right. So yeah. it was like, it was just like, Oh, fear everywhere. And like, you turn on the news and it's like vaccinate or not vaccinate. Like it was just, yeah. it was bananas. So my anxiety was just, time. yeah. It was, I, yeah. It, it ramped up again. Uh, and so after a little while I started working for friends um, and that was pretty good. But again, my anxiety was going through the roof and, and then I started, uh, I can't remember. My wife says she, it was her that planted the seed, but I don't remember it, mm-hmm. but I believe her, but I, I started looking smart man, into, smart a- man. <laughs> <laughs> but I started looking into ADHD assessments and I, it took me like two years to find an assessment. Uh, and, and because I, well, actually one of the things was we had a family reunion at one point and like all my cousins and uncles were talking about their ADHD meds. And I was like, Oh, wait, you all have ADHD. They we're like, yeah, so do you. I'm like, I do. Don't you? <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. <laughs> Nobody said so anyway, it took me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it took me about two years and I finally got the assessment. And then 
Yeah. It was like I leveled up again. It was just like, boop, 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 boop. it was like, whoa, you know, I, I thought I was, this, this is great. Cause now, mm. uh, in, you know, when I, when I talk to a counselor or a therapist, it's through the lens of ADHD now. So it's like very, like, it, yeah, it's, it's, I can't even explain it. It was just life changing having that diagnosis and that validation and, and knowing, you know, like now when it's like, if, if I'm having anxiety and all this, these things are like coming at me, it's like, oh, I'm not an, a piece of shit or I'm not lazy or I'm not worthless. It's just, I'm just having, I'm just ADHDing right now. Yeah. And like, so yeah. it's like, yeah, it's you nice mentioned something about, um, par um, ADHD paralysis. Right. Yeah. Um, like things like that, even just to find out that's why a diagnosis is so important because yeah, like how much trauma that would have maybe saved you years ago if you'd just understood what was happening to you. Exactly. Yeah. Like all that negative self talk inside your head and all the feelings of worthlessness and all these things that, that if you don't have, like I, I'm finding people, I felt like I was almost more supported or understood better when I just had anxiety, depression and, and addictions. It was like, people were more empathetic. Now, when I tell people I have ADHD, they're like, oh, yeah, I don't know. Everybody has so ADHD. Everybody has that. Or, yeah, I don't know. I don't, really, I don't even know if I believe in that shit. It's like, but this is why I had anxiety, depression, and addiction exactly. issues. Exactly. Because they, so That's you're okay with my symptoms. That's why these are so important. Yeah. 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 You were empathetic with me for my symptoms, but the diagnosis, you poo poo. So, mm -hmm. so it's weird, mm -hmm. but so it's, that's a little frustrating, but at the same time, it, it doesn't fucking matter because I understand it now. It's like, oh, okay, this is, yes. this is a, a bit of a relief. And, and like I said, and you know, I, I was working with my friends for a while. Things were, my mental health wasn't great again. And I wasn't sure what was going on. Part of it is ADHD. I just, I don't, I just don't think I can work for people. <laughs> like, and, and it sounds Fair like, enough. you know, I've, and I've had people like, well, you just got to bite the bullet. You know, you just gotta, you got, I can't, I literally, it's like physically painful to get out of bed some days to go to work. Yeah. And I can't explain, I know. And then they're like my best friends. I'm working for my friends and still I'm just like, oh, this sucks so fucking much. And I, I don't know why I, I couldn't do it, but yeah. so, uh, so yeah, this summer was kind of a rough thing, but, um, you know, I was laid off work. So I thought, well, here's my opportunity to, to dive, uh, you know, put up, dive in head first with the podcast, yeah. well, not head first. But like, because <laughs> I've already been doing it for a couple of years, but like you dipped your devote toe all my time. And then, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and uh, yeah. And I've been doing speaking uh, engagements off and on too. Oh, and those are always great. Like I, I really, I love talking to high school kids because mm -hmm. they're just, I mean, I am a high school kid. So yeah. <laughs> they relate to me. We have a great yeah. time. It's awesome. And I like speaking uh, uh, to like uh, people in recovery and stuff or mm -hmm. and that's because they get it. But, um, but anyway, so uh, yeah. And then, uh, yeah. So, so th that sexual traumatic stuff that I was talking about before, mm -hmm. again, it was like, I, I hadn't dealt with that. I, I didn't even think of it as trauma for a long, 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 long time until those peel, those, that onion peel layers came down. Mm -hmm. And as I think it was my dad that said, it was like, uh, you couldn't deal with that stuff. You had to deal with all this other stuff so that you were in a good place so that you can deal with that stuff now. So right. even this fall, you know, I've been working with EMDR, like I was saying, EMDR therapy. And so it's, yeah, it's just this. So how is your experience? Just this constant EMDR? thing. Yeah. Pardon me. How was your experience with EMDR? How do you like it? I was good. Yeah. Um, I think I had about eight or nine sessions. I, I, um, I haven't done it for a while now, but it was good. Um, I didn't, she, you know, people ask me like, did it work? It's like, <laughs> I, I don't know. It's hard to know. <laughs> I isn't think it? so. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think other people notice more than I would, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's working. Cause like, I, I have, I feel like I have more value and like my worthlessness feelings aren't as bad anymore. And it's like, but, but also I'm with ADHD, new meds and stuff too. So it's like, it's hard to tell what's 
doing what, but I think whatever, it's whatever a combination. Yeah. Yeah. Probably right? is. Yeah. So, so yeah. Um, I like to think I'm doing pretty good now. Yeah. Well, like yeah. Said, and you're killing this it. Time on your next podcast. year it could be. Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. It's, that's it's exciting been stuff. Growing. Like you've had some pretty big people on your show and it's been. Which I don't yeah, understand. Like, I do. I mean, because you're so interesting. Like you, you are. You do have a very um, charismatic, in a way of, yeah. Anyways. Oh, I am so. charming. You're charming. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, no, well, you're real. Like you act real. You don't like you're not pretentious. I guess you know what I mean. It's just you're a real person telling real stories, and you're not sugarcoating right. stuff. And I think that that's that's a cool yeah. thing. Oh, good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, see, I think it is working because I don't like compliments or I haven't yeah. in the past. Also, so there you go. See, I, I accepted that compliment. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's been weird. I don't know how I managed to get some of the guests that I've got. Like, it's amazing what people will do if you just ask them. Yes. It's finding the the contact that's the hardest part, but mm -hmm. a lot of these people are just on Instagram. I just send them a message. They're like, sure. I'm like, yeah. you will. <laughs> yeah. Like what? what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've well, and I think because people, people do want to share, they really do want to share. And if they're given a, the, the platform to do it in a safe place, like feeling in a safe, you know, in a manner that way it's yeah. Why I not? guess. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the nice thing about the podcast is like, it's not all just, you know, high profile people. Mm -hmm. It's also like people from my town and people I met in treatment. And so it's like everyday people plus people that were, you know, were on Netflix or whatever, you know, they had yeah. a show on Netflix or whatever, yes. you know, it's like, yeah. and, and that, and like you were saying before, like mental health affects everybody and, and trauma, we're all touched by trauma. And so, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it can be a high profile person or I could just knock on my neighbor's door and I'm sure I could, I could interview them because everybody's gone through something. That's right. Everybody's the weird thing is, something. Yeah. and the weird thing is so many people don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's, that's the most frustrating part is like, if we normalize it, then maybe healthcare systems and stuff will like prioritize their money more towards these things, but because no one right. talks about it, then well, why throw money at it? If no mm -hmm. one's even talking about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly. Well, because it, it needs to just become a thing where, you know, it's like going to the eye doctor. I'm going to my psychiatrist. It shouldn't have exactly. to be hidden that you're having to go for, for these therapies. And I know for myself, since I've started this, I've opened up a ton to people and now I'm just in a place where, you know, after I say it to somebody who's newer to me, I think, oh, I wonder what they think of me. And of course, I still go back to those insecurities. But in the end, I just you kind of start to realize the more you share it, shockingly, how many people just empathize right away or share back. And yeah, like you said, that's right. you just have to ask and they'll a lot of people, well, I don't have anything to share. And then they start talking and it's like, oh, I do. <laughs> I have way and, more and stuff thing, than I thought. And and the thing about sharing, it, it's like, it almost gives other people permission to share their mm -hmm. story then. It's like, oh, oh, we can talk about this. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's okay. Yeah. I, 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 I um, the job I had outside of uh, treatment, um, I started off as casual and I ended up being full time. It was a, I was at a carpenter at a theater production place. So I was building like sets and things like that. Oh. And, and yeah, it was, it was super cool. And so it was, it was also very, you know, liberal minded and very supportive, uh, you know, group of people that I was working with, but we, we were having staff meetings where it's like every staff meeting, we'd take one person and they would kind of have a little bio about themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the staff meeting was my turn. And I said, uh, you know, a lot of people say they're proud cancer survivors i'm a proud suicide attempt survivor and you know some people were shocked by that mm -hmm. and i was like but but i am and, and like i'm not ashamed that i had you know i went through a shitty time yeah i'm proud that i'm still here like i had that shitty time and i'm okay and mm -hmm. 
Um, and yeah, and and like and people started crying. Men and talked about people it. cried and clapped. It was like amazing. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like Whoa. that's awesome. But yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, and the fact that you're a man sharing it because that's the thing is it, oftentimes women are more able to speak up because we do tend to share more with our girlfriends and whatever. But men are, you know, it's still, I think it's becoming a little bit more um, easy for, for men to start opening up a bit, but it's still very hard it to is. admit that kind of, like, it's a weakness or, um, yeah, even Especially the fact that you bring up the Especially in small town Saskatchewan. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Especially well, in small town Saskatchewan. Angry. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, so, yeah, I don't want to get too personal with stuff, but um my son was having some, you know, mental health issues recently, as mm-hmm. I think every teenager does. Yep. And I, I said to my wife, like, she was kind of upset and worried. And I was like, hey, this is a win. Like, <laughs> at least he's not, like, getting drunk and fighting like all the guys did in high when I was in high school. <laughs> like, that's mm-hmm. how we dealt with our emotions. Yep. He told us. And he, you know, he was also seeing a counselor at the time and stuff. So I was like, this is, this is good. This is Yep. You've moved a step ahead. You've, you've been leading by influence, like you've been influencing him. He sees that, right? So if dad can do this, if he can open up, then I can have a conversation with my dad. I guess. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. You know what? It seems like, well, it's a a weird time because more and more people are talking or being open about it, but there's also more, it seems like there's more teen youth suicides right now too. Well, and the and unfortunate, so, like, it's hard, isn't it? I know. I know. And I don't think it's because we are talking about it. So then they're getting that idea, which a lot of people throw that twist. It's like, no, it's mm-hmm. actually, there's proof to showing. Like, yes. look at my son. Like, there's proof right there that it, it's helpful to to be open about it because then you, mm-hmm. you're, you're normalizing it and you're open about it. Yeah. So I don't know if it's just, I don't know what it is. There's also you know, no I challenges wonder, though, too, that I didn't, like, we didn't have the internet and like, we didn't, I mean, no. we didn't have... Yeah, we didn't have. Well, COVID. have you ever gotten any? <laughs> have you ever gotten any negative feedback on your on your Instagram, for instance? Has anybody ever been negative towards you? Has you know? You think about those challenges alone for a kid. They they get on Instagram. They put a picture up that thinks somebody makes fun of it. Any? I know for me, I've had things, and it's just small things, but it still gets to me. And I can't imagine being at a vulnerable age and having even just one. Like the trolls are horrible right now. Yeah. Horrible. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm sure I have. I just, I, for whatever reason, it didn't bother me mm-hmm. or, or it was so stupid or so minor that I was just like, yeah. Okay. You clearly don't understand. So I'm, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like I'm the healthy one here. You, you, are, <laughs> you know, right. I mean? like, yes. there's yeah. a lot of ill people that there like are. trolls are sick, are people that are, to me, they're, they're ill. They're, they're hurting, mm-hmm. they're in pain and they're yeah, exactly. projecting and they're it's like, no, no, no. You're, you're the one that's, mm-hmm. you know, needs help right now. Not me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, but I, I can't think of any real negative comments yeah. that I've. Well, that's I, good. I've I won't, this was with something years ago and I remember it was a on TikTok. I did a video or something and it was the meanest thing. Well, at least at the time it mm. felt that way. Now I kind of laugh about it, but I remember thinking, geez, I'm a grown adult and it, it stung. Like that was really a shitty thing to say. And so when you're a kid and you've got like maybe your peers that are, are bringing, you know, you have to go to school the next day when we were little or we were in school, you went home and you did your own thing and you watched cable TV, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You didn't think about what somebody was doing when they got home. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And with my, my oldest son, I mean, his set grade 10, 11, 12 was during COVID. And oh, like, that's, yeah. he, he, his social skills are like out to lunch and mm-hmm. like he, he, he has uh, social anxiety and stuff. And now he's in university and trying to deal like, <laughs> like, it's, yeah. Plus all the other crap that you have to go through at that age. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's not easy being, being, their age right now no. um i also wonder if um uh, you know maslow is it maslow's hierarchy of needs hmm, I don't it's, know. Like, it's like this pyramid of like what's you know it's like 
on the bottom is like shelter and food. And then the next one up is like physical health. And then, and, and then, you know, uh, so anyway, I, I think, you know, in my generation, when I was a kid, we did, we weren't fortunate enough to worry about mental health because we had, there was, you know, that day and age, we, we had other things to worry about that were prioritized. Yeah. Now I think it's almost like we are privileged in a way that we can now focus on mental health mm -hmm. and prioritize that. And so I think that's also another reason why it's maybe, um, you know, stigmas are changing and stuff because generally speaking, we all have food and shelter and things. We don't have to worry about that stuff. And mm -hmm. I mean, of course, some people do. I'm not saying that we're all, <laughs> but yeah. generally speaking, we live in a wealthy nation. That's we're all taken care of ish. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so then you, okay, what's the next level up that we can worry about? And that's, you know, yeah. emotional and mental and needs. Yeah. So I don't know. That's a theory of mine. <laughs> no, I, I think that's, you know, there's a lot to that. I, you know, because we have opening up the stigma to it and everything, it, it is a way to get it out. And no, I think everything you just said made sense. I can't say it the same way, so I won't. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not saying that's the sole thing. I'm just saying I think no, that's No, but that's also one of the contributing, one yeah. Of the, yeah. Yeah, exactly. For sure. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but but it still baffles me why there's so much. I mean, nobody committed suicide when I was in high school. No right. one in my school did. It seems like one, every couple of years now, there's a, mm -hmm. a local kid here that's dying. And I'm like, what, what the, why? What the fuck is that about? I don't, I don't understand what's going on. Well, I think our world is so... It's scary right now. I mean, it was, you know, we had things that were scary when we were younger too, but to the extent that they are, and now we actually see what's happening all the time with everything. Yeah. And um, we, I was, unfortunately, there were a few in when I graduated that, that did. And um, actually somebody really close to me, her, her brother had um, died by suicide. And um, so, you know, I grew up like, right away kind of being aware of it and um mm. even back then it was like a social side of things it was the social stuff that that got him right so now mm -hmm. you i think that's mm -hmm. honestly how it has evolved and gotten higher and higher and higher it's just kids have so much pressure i can't imagine like i said coming home from school and you know your friend's gone to hawaii for vacation well now you get to see every part of that trip to Hawaii, mm -hmm. <laughs> whereas mm -hmm. your house in real time, maybe, exactly. So, yeah. you know, and what do you have at your home? And just that comparison all the time. There's just comparing, comparing, comparing. So if you have anxiety yourself, it's just going to exacerbate all of that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Even though the stigmas are changing, and there is, mm -hmm. you know, on my phone, it's like it's the entire encyclopedia. That was in my library at school on my phone, plus yeah. 10 million other things. <laughs> like, That's right. So they have access. They, the stigma is changing, but yet it's still not changing fast enough. At the, sa at the rate it should. At the same yeah. rate. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. We can't keep up. Dang. Just like you can't keep up with technology. It's like you just. And it's it's also. And then the mental health system itself. So Exactly. Yeah. Is like still from the nineties. Like, it's like it is. things have changed a lot and the system hasn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. So it's, so what do we do? Hopefully things, what do we do? Well, we keep carrying on. I'm just kidding. We, um, <laughs> <laughs> we keep talking about it and we keep, you know, things like, like these topics, even just if, if the kid's not going to listen to my show, I'm assuming maybe you never know, they might turn that show on and it might be the one that, you know, they hear us talk about, well, you know what, it wasn't like that then. They, you know, maybe somebody, an older person actually gets that this is a stressful thing for me. They do right. understand. I'm not just a stupid kid who's just got, you know, like, you're not. And, and your feelings are what, real. It's amazing yeah. what just validation will do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. It was funny, my, Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how my son's going to feel about me talking about him, but he was worried like the other night when he was having some, some issues, it was weird. Cause he, 
even though he knows to talk about it and stuff, he was still worried about telling me because he wasn't sure how I would react or if he would cause me more anxiety and depression. So he was, you know, so, so then, so then that, yeah. yeah, So then that made me feel bad. (laughs) It was like, like, shit, it just backfired. Me talking about my anxiety has caused my son anxiety because he doesn't want to tell me about his anxiety. (laughs) Right. Well, you don't know what the right and wrong thing is, but it's still better than not, than sweeping it under the rug. Absolutely. And, and, and my reaction wasn't, you know, like fly off the handle or, Mm -hmm. you know, sounding alarm bells or, or freaking out or anything. It was like, it was just, uh, it was just, just like we're talking here. And I was like, Mm -hmm. are you surprised with my reaction? He's like, yeah. (laughs) yeah, yeah. It's, and yeah just That's simply validating his kids. feelings yep yeah sorry and and just being able to relate to him and being like this is what you're thinking he's like yes that's exactly what it's like and I was being like okay this is what it actually is you're, you're being irrational right now and you know and it was like it was nice and so mm-hmm. yeah it was yeah so hopefully i saved him you know, 10 years. Oh, I, I, I believe you probably did because you, at least you made it, you validated it at the moment instead of waiting 10 years. Oh, well, why? I was, was I normal to feel that way? Yeah. I mean, there's lots of incidences where we do and should feel anxious. We just, we well, yeah, dumb, right. But um, yeah. like to hear it from, especially from a male role model, his dad and, you know, that also speaks volumes for his empathy and his compassion and, and what you've kind of given to him as a family. You know, I'm sure he's seen your wife oh. with like how she's responded to things. And, you know, it just, it, it they do, they do actually learn from us. <laughs> we <laughs> don't want to tell them thing. that secret. <laughs> yeah. <But laughs> well, I, you know, I've, I've also taught him like, you know, stuff that might get him in trouble in the future but it's like that's okay really dark humor you know an yeah. yeah. un- inappropriate timing and stuff like that you know? right <laughs> being human <laughs> yeah so it's like that's yeah. the fun stuff for me it's like oh i taught him anxiety shit uh, but i also taught him how to be very you know uh i don't know satire <laughs> yes yeah there's always the good and the bad right we do, uh, that's why we're not we're not considered perfect we just nobody gives us a handbook on how to to raise kids especially when you're trying to raise Speaking yourself handbooks for raising time. kids yes what is your book <laughs> I, 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 I was gonna ask that earlier and um i forgot so thank oh, you yeah i did finish my story actually oh. so that night i quit drinking and i came into the house and i opened up the word document and i typed something it was like a suicide note it was actually okay. the first um first draft in my kids book sometimes daddy cries oh, okay. and i mean it was it was very basic and it was basically um like I, I couldn't just write a suicide note i had to make it like you know weird <laughs> <laughs> so it's like through the eyes of a kid watching his dad go through depression was right. my anyway um but uh, yeah, sometimes Daddy cries. My kids' book, and it's on Amazon and online or whatever. And um, yeah, it's that's. I'm not proud of a lot of things in my life, but that's that's one thing I'm very proud of. It's it's uh, and and yeah, and the, the illustrator, she's amazing. Yeah, thank you. Um, it is. Yeah. yeah. How many people can yeah. say they've done that? You know, I I just think, especially through all of the things that you've, you know, you've gone through and experienced, and to come out the other side with something yeah. like that. Yeah. It took four years to write a kid's book. <laughs> it took COVID. I've got a kid's book to write that I've been thinking about writing since my kids were three and now they're 21. So, ah. Uh, there you go. Yeah. So that, that was I blame I blame the ADHD for that. Is like I'd I'd work on it for a bit, leave it for like a year and a half, and then yeah, COVID hit. And it was like, okay, I got time. Yeah. <laughs> but and timing's but yeah, everything. It's, Right. So it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's something I'm very proud of. And it's, you know, it gets really good reviews from parents and professionals. And, and again, speaking of males and females, sorry, I, I don't know. This is going to be like a three hour long episode for you, but <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I have yet to sell it to a male. Oh, I wonder why uh, I'm online. I think I have, but like, okay. Anytime I've had copies, it's always, either the wife of 
uh, a husband that's going through uh, mm-hmm. mental health issues or the mother or the, you know, the grandmother, it's always someone else buying it for a male um, for whatever reason, men. And like I, I told you earlier, before we started recording, I think 80% of my listeners on my podcast are female. So yeah, yeah I, I, I don't know. Men, men are for whatever reason, it's still tough for men to, I don't know, accept maybe that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is, but it's, it's well, frustrating. Because they, because... You know, I talking to, cause I have three sons and my two younger ones are twins and I do talk to them about this stuff and, you know, they've expressed the need to maybe start meditating and start doing all these like different ways to heal. And who do you, who do you open up to though? Who do you, what right. is there a men's group? It's very hard there to are. find still. There are, but it's. And there, and there's more like they're coming. Male mental health podcasts and safe yes. or safe spaces and stuff. Yeah. And some of them are very manly and gruff. Yes. Some of them are not, you know, and there's, it's still, there's more than there ever was, but it's still mm-hmm. hard for, for men to, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Yeah. Well, because they don't, it's not talked about enough. And, and I think that that's, yeah, the, the more you get your show out there, the more you share what you're doing too. Um, I often think too, with my podcast, am I oversharing? Have I posted too much? Like I, you know, you, you get that self doubt and it's like, well, no, if whoever, it may not be the same person that you think wants to see it. It might be somebody totally different. Somebody that would, you would least expect. Sorry, I, I right. talk with my yeah. hands a lot. <laughs> well, I did it because I saw a big hair floating oh, in front of my face. I thought maybe you were. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Uh, yeah. 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 So. It, yeah. It's true. And yeah. Yeah. There's different, yeah. there's subcultures of men too. And it's like, I live in a very small Saskatchewan town and. Yeah. I. Yeah. I have a hard time relating with dudes around here a bit. <laughs> I'm, not gonna lie. I'm from Alberta, so <laughs> we're similar. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, a lot of guys like skidooing and shooting things and playing hockey yeah. and farming and stuff. And I'm like, I'm going to paint something and talk about my feelings on the internet. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, I don't know if I'm influencing the people that maybe need the influencing. I don't know. You never know, though. <laughs> It might be the guy that you yeah, least expect. True. Maybe he's sitting like with his earphones in waiting for that deer to show up because, you know, it's been eight hours in the cold and he's listening to Todd Renenbaum. Renenbaum. <laughs> Renenbaum. Ren- you See, did now I said anything. it wrong. <laughs> 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 I said it wrong this time. Yeah. So you just never know who you're going to, who's going to hear you. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. true. And so, I mean, I love, and really, I don't talk about myself that much on my podcast. Mm-hmm. Right. So I just like hearing other people's stuff. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's so how I, I don't know too. how much, yeah. I don't know how much I'm helping people anyway, because I'm just listening like they are. <laughs> well, except you, I'm on your podcast right now, I guess. See, and that's where things nah. like, because you're willing to share it and you're willing to, your people trust you enough to tell the, your story to them or their story to you. Sorry. So right, yeah, right. I mean it's it's helping. Yeah, yeah, that's freaky, man. When that yeah. happens, yeah, it does freak me out. I've had some people that were like, well, I've had quite a few guests actually say, you know, I've never actually told anyone that before. Or, I've no one's ever asked me that before. Or, no one's. Mm-hmm. It's like it freaks me out. I was like, oh, why me? <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's like I'm honored, and like, but at the same time, I was like, oh, yeah, Ugh. like yeah, I mm. get that, and it at the same I guess time, I am like, charming. Well, I can say it to you, but I'd never say it to myself. I'd be like, well, why not you? <laughs> why I not guess, tell yeah. you? Right? Yeah. So Maybe because I ask. Maybe other people don't ask. Yeah. And you actually have, and that's the thing you, I think speaking also from a point of view of like having experienced it yourself is, is right. speaks yeah. volumes right there. Like you get all those little in and like you, you can kind of pick the brain a little bit more as to, oh, well, why was, were the you know, what happened next? I can almost tell you what happened next, but yeah. <laughs> or at true. least imagine it better. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So. yeah. Well, there you go. All right. Are we done? We're done. Are we done? <laughs> <laughs> sure. What's the last, I just have one other question. What's the last best sure. thing you do every night before bed? 
Right. I remember you asking me this. Uh, so every night before bed, uh, I go to bed several hours after my wife goes to bed. <laughs> she goes to bed at nine. I go to bed at like one. Uh, so, uh, you know, I get the house, you know, I turn the lights on and all this stuff. And then we have two dogs. Uh, one dog likes sleeping in bed with us. The other one prefers his uh, his kennel. Not that we lock him in there, but he just prefers his little space. But so the one that sleeps in his kennel, I give him kisses and hugs and I let him know how beautiful he is and how wonderful he is. And then uh, the other one, I scoop her up and uh, the one goes off into his kennel. And then I take her and get into bed with my wife and she curls up in my armpit and yeah. I fall asleep with this this two beautiful women in my bed. Yeah. Oh, right on. That's, that's <laughs> nice. That's wonderful. Yeah. 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 I like that's my awesome. doggies. Yeah. And I mean, that's, I love hearing everybody's responses because it's totally different. Some people feel guilty because they watch a show or they, you know, <laughs> right, <laughs> but it's right. always something special to them. And I think that's also why I like to ask because it's relatable. It doesn't matter what you're doing. If it's the last best thing you're doing, that's all that matters. Hmm. Yeah. That's so. a good question. I like that. Thank you for tuning into today's episode. Um, I sure hope you enjoyed this um, this episode as much as I did. It was awesome with Todd. He's so relatable. Um, he's real, and um, yeah, he's he's doing so much for the mental health community, and you know, for awareness and advocacy. It's 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 really top notch. And I, you know, I would recommend his podcast hands down. Um, you can find him on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and um, he's also on YouTube now. So it's uh, Bunny Hugs and Mental Health Podcast. And he's also, you can find him on Instagram or on Facebook at Bunny Hugs Podcast. Um, yeah, give him some, show him some support and give him a follow and check out his show. Um, yeah, so this is, again, thank you for listening. Um, if you feel compelled to share my podcast, Carry On With Carrie. Um, I am now available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Amazon Music. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Carry On With Carrie underscore podcast or on Facebook at Carry On With Carrie podcast. Uh, yeah, if you feel compelled to share and follow and all those good things, um, you know, maybe just perhaps we can help just one more person at a time. 